Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Constantine Karanopoulos and Mark Chalmers about the deal you two just announced last night, which is really substantial news for the overall rare earth industry, specifically in North America. Who should I let talk first about this deal? Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look, and I think I let Constantine. He's been in the business longer than I have, Tracy. So, Constantine, the floor is yours. Um, what Mark means, Tracy, is that I have a lot less hair than he does because when I started, I had a full head of hair. So, Mark, this is what you have to look forward to. Um, so, listen, I, Mark uh, and Tracy have spoken to you separately about this. And I, I will make the same comment I made to Mark when we met in April and started working on this, that I always felt that monazites could be you know, a, a, a great game changer for the industry, um, byproduct, great distribution, but they have thorium and uranium, which are, you know, not everybody can handle. And when we met with Mark, um, this is what I said to him as well. You, you know, energy fuels is the missing link to, to solving that monazite problem. And I'm glad we've gotten to stage one because this is only the beginning. Uh, we're starting with available capacity, both at Energy Fuels and NEO, and we're maximizing sort of the, the immediate benefit with a highly efficient um, use of capital. We're spending very little new money to do what we're trying to do, and uh, we're both very excited about this. And, you know, we could set a, a new example of how things could be done. Um, in uh, not only in our industry, but probably in the, in, in the broader um, critical materials universe. In fact, just further to that, Frederick Kozak wrote last night in response to your news release, he said, when ramped up to commercial scale, this new rare earth supply chain is expected to constitute the first time in over 20 years that monazite ore from the U.S. will be used as a feedstock to manufacture separated rare earth materials outside of China. Mark, let's talk about that and how you how this came about. Obviously, you two started speaking in April of last year. Look how fast you've moved this along. Okay, yeah, yeah, Tracy. Um, yeah, we've been moving very quickly. Um, as you know, we didn't announce that we're getting into the rare earth space until April of 2020. Uh, but I think that we've uh, been very focused. Uh, we brought in uh, advisors like Constantine and Neo, um, uh, Jack Lifton and Brock O'Kelly, uh, who had a long history working at MP or Mountain Pass. Um, so, you know, we, we've, we've, we've been very purposeful in the fact that we've been focused on monazite for the reasons Constantine gave uh, because of the, the, the uranium and the thorium content was our core business and we could treat that material. Uh, right now, uh, the state of Utah is very supportive in this initiative. And but at the same time, uh, I always use a phrase that I, I tell people I, I know what I don't know. And uh, we've been very focused on making sure that we have the right mix of people, uh, equipment and, and availability to, to move this initiative back or forward very quickly. Well, I'll tell you, I think this is some of the most substantial news we have seen in the rare earth sector in quite some time. And interesting to me, just want to direct this to you, Constantine, a lot of NEO's current rare earth demand is coming from Europe, okay? Um, can you see, can you comment on how this demand is growing and where it might also be coming from in the future? Sure. Um, Europe is, um, I, I think, in all of my conversations with our investors as well as customers in Europe, it is absolutely apparent and it's um, making, it, it's demonstrating itself in an increasing way every day that Europe have done, you know, the EU and the member states, they've done an awful lot of really good things to drive and encourage demand um, by the consumer for EVs. As a result, last month and the month before, from what I was reading, Europe produced and sold more EVs uh, than China, which is the first in the last three years, because China has been dominating 
uh, that sector. However, demand in Europe is driving supply chains, and Europe is encouraging the establishment of both battery and drivetrain, therefore motor and rare earth magnet uh, supply chains in Europe. So, you know, we, we, we tend not to engage in geopolitics. We go where the demand is. And if the demand is in Europe, we have the only facility that produces rare earths in Europe, and hopefully we'll figure out a way to do a lot more there and perhaps go further downstream with more value-added products and alloys and magnets and so on. So we're very excited about, you know, in terms of what we're seeing in Europe. And I think there's lessons there for the rest of the world, including Canada, which, you know, we need to get going with some of our industrial policies. But I'll leave that for another conversation, Trace. Well, of course, let's just jump to North American. Uh, North America, please. Mark, what do you see the implications of this initiative for rare earth consumers in North America? Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, well, I think you got to start somewhere. Um, you know, this this uh, gap in the ability to process rare earths in, in North America uh, it goes back a, a few decades. Um, so, you know, we want to take these these first steps showing that we can uh, go ahead and, and and make this, this you know, rare earth uh, carbonate. Uh, certainly the relationship with NEO, because there is no separation in the United States, uh, you, know, you know, is able to build a bridge uh, to Europe in that regard. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, really you're starting uh, with a kind of almost a zero basis in the United States when it comes to processing currently uh, of rare earths and rare earth products. So, you know, we'd like to expand that with time. And, and as Constantine said, you know, our relationship uh, you know, we have existing infrastructure that that's, that's has capacity right now and scalability. So, look, at it's early days, but it is it is our objective um, that, that this is a big deal and that, that we are able to show over the next uh, few years uh, at, a, at a pace that probably people didn't expect uh, that we're able to, to, to grow this, uh, you know, many fold uh, from where we are today. Okay, well, congratulations to both of you. I, I have enjoyed some of the analyst commentary on what this actually means for the sector. I actually, uh, uh, one analyst actually put it to text that he thought this would slow down the interest in any other U.S. processing facilities. Would either of you like to comment on that? No. <laughs> you know, it, there's, there's a lot of good projects around and there's room for a lot of good responsible operators. I think eventually, as the EV industry takes hold in a much bigger way in North America, there will be a continuing need for more supply, but also, as Mark pointed out, for more downstream processing. So I, I think this is not hurting any new project, but you know they will have to come up with a business model that works because you know I, we may have set a benchmark here with Mark. Uh, for a project that works in probably the most efficient use of capital that I have ever come across in our industry, using incremental capacity, uh, byproduct, feed material. I, I really like all aspects of it. So, you know, uh, I don't think it, it, it means that other projects will be slowed down as long as these projects have a, a proper, valuable business proposition. And, you know, uh, White Mesa could eventually process other minerals, um, you know, given the excellent capabilities that energy fuels have in White Mesa, it could be the missing link, not only for monazites, but for a lot of other minerals that need to find a proper place to be processed by people who know what they're doing. Perhaps I'm being too politically correct here. Having sat through more than a thousand billable hours of discussions on rare earths and sustainability in our supply chain here in North America, one of the items that have been really drilled home is that we can't compete with the Chinese because they can simply make rare earths more cost effective. Now, it's my understanding that what the two of your companies bring together in this initiative is a cost effective and competitive solution. Is that correct? Well, I, I think our focus from the very beginning has been on world competitive capital and operating costs for earth production. So, you know, we're pretty confident. It's early days. We've got a lot of work to do. 
but we're pretty confident that we can be cost competitive with the world. And I think that's where you have to be to be successful long term. So, um, you know, our, our, our focus is in that regard. And, um, you know, the beauty of the, the Monazai plan is we're dealing with very high grades um, to start with. And as Constantine said, with very good distributions as well. So that's going to be our focus initially. And we'll just see how it goes. But, but we're very encouraged and very excited of where this could take us. Let me challenge that um, original premise, uh, Tracy, because, you know, Neil has been competing with, with China. In fact, we have plants in China, but we also have plants in Europe and Thailand where we make magnetic materials. Um, so is it possible to compete with the big Chinese producers? Yes, as long as you have a proper business plan and you have a project that is well thought through and it, you have to ensure that you are always competitive in, ter in terms of your cost structure. And again, as Mark pointed out, this is a very cost competitive project. Just, you know, similar to th those who are familiar, at least, with uh, basnazites from China and Bauto rare earths utilizing a byproduct, basnazite from iron ore processing, you know, collectively, Kim Moore's is recovering an extremely high grade uh, rare earth uh, mineral, monazite, which is then, you know, effectively zero mining costs. Mark is cracking that mineral into a usable feed material for downstream separation, separation and recovering the uranium values as well. So that helps the overall economics. And Mark is doing that with available capacity and capabilities. And the, and the feed material comes to our existing plant in Silmet that is just complementing our existing arrangements. So we're not spending any significant incremental capital. So that's what I meant earlier. There's an exceptionally efficient use of capital here that I, I, you know, I would bet dollars to donuts for anybody to come up with a project that, is, that has a more efficient cost of capital per ton of REO separated collectively in this, uh, this three-way deal. Well, again, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you both for joining us today. And before you leave, can you just tell us what we should be looking forward to in, say, the next quarter uh, with this initiative? I, I think that um, from our perspective, from Energy Fuels, um, you know, the, our investors can expect uh, trucks arriving to the event, trucks starting to go to Estonia as part of this arrangement. Uh, we hope to have um, good news flow with other initiatives because, you know, the original agreement with Camores and Neo, uh, we plan to build on that uh, over the next, uh, you know, few months. And I think it's going to be an exciting place for our investors and for NEO investors uh, because we're going to actually be doing something uh, quickly and cost effectively, as Constantine says. So, so uh, watch this space, but I, I think it's, it's going to surprise people on the upside on the kind of progress we can make uh, as we've made in the last year. The, the whole concept, the whole idea of going from nothing an idea in Mark's head and in my head to actual deliver shipments of full container loads of rare earth carbonate originating in the United States, cracked in the United States, and shipped to for separation in Europe, you know, 12 months, 10 months, 14 months, whatever it is, it's extraordinary. And, and I think eventually people will, will grasp the importance of this. But as I said, we're... We're, well, this is step one in what we both hope to be a complete game changer for the industry. Um, so we're, we're going to ride this, and uh, we're, we're really excited about it. Extraordinary news indeed. Thank you both for joining us today. It's, uh, it's wonderful news. Thank you, Tracy. Yep. And also, before we go, um, I would like to say thank you to Tracy for being the... Um, um, the the person who introduced Mark and myself. So, you know, you had a, a big hand in this, Tracy. So, again, thank you a bit more publicly. Yeah, and I'd like to echo that too, Tracy. Corporate matchmaker here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Have a good day.